I just want people to take away one or two things and implement them into their you know day to day life. And you know, I think our ability to to share that is through food and by cooking delicious things. So you know, if people want to cook the way we do, you kind of have to start to live the way we're living. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Sustainability means different things to different people. The way they approach it can be in small baby steps or trying to take on the world. Some can be bullish about the messaging. Others find a way to dig deeper, put their hands in the soil, challenge their own thinking and live and breathe a new way of approaching what it means to be more sustainable especially when it comes to food and for our future generations. Matt Stone is one of Australia's most influential chefs and co-owner of Future Food Systems. Matt, how are you going? I'm great, thanks, mate. Thanks for the kind words. Well, um, you're a bit of a legend uh, down under with everything that you've done in regards to sustainability and very much looking forward to talking about Future Food Systems. I know you're currently on the banks of the Yarra um, so there may be a few boats going past um, in the background. But um, t- t- tell us about how this all started with Future Food Systems. Well, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty extreme experiment, really. We, um, we kind of we make it up as we go in a lot of aspects, but I guess it's a, um, it's a, a long-term collaboration uh, between myself and Yost and Joe. So Yost and I have worked together on various projects all across Australia for, for around 12 years. Um, Joe's been on the scene for the last eight with us um, on, on this crazy journey. And I guess the Future Food System was something that we'd always dreamed up, um, something that we imagined could be you know, a pinnacle for change, a catalyst to to make people think differently. And um, yeah, luckily Federation Square partnered with us and gave us the space to, to put it. Well, it's pretty extraordinary. And you're, you're actually living there as well. What's it like living in Federation Square? Uh, it's quite strange. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, every now and then when I don't shut the curtain in the morning, you wake up and there's people kind of staring in at you. And I guess we've just kind of um, just kind of got used to it. We do split our time between our house in Northcote as well. Um, Pickles, our little puppy, doesn't love being here so much. It's a bit busy. So, um, yeah, like that, when we're operating the restaurant, you know, over the weekends and stuff, we stay. And then on our days off, we'll head back out to Northcote just to, to break it up. But we never um, – this was always meant to be just a house. Uh and we were going to continue working at Oak Ridge and live here. Uh, but then, obviously, things got a bit weird last year and things changed. And, um, you know, we just decided that we wanted to put all of our effort and time into making this the most amazing project we possibly could. And, you know, just in our nature between Joe and I, the, the best way we can share this idea is through, you know, a plate of food. So we um, turned it into a tiny restaurant. Well, I'm very much looking forward to exploring what you're growing and uh, and serving there as well. But t- tell us about the early days and creating the structure and what you guys did. Well, it's uh, yeah. I mean, working with Yoast is um, uh, look. It's always challenging. Uh, it's always exciting. But he, like I mentioned earlier, he kind of makes it up as he goes as well with the building. Like there wasn't really a project manager as such. So. You know, it was kind of a lot of things were decided at the moment as, as it would be in a kitchen. So I guess kind of, you know, in theory, a lot of the way it was put together is the way we still cook and, and operate the, the restaurant. So it was, a, um, it was a pretty crazy journey. It took a lot longer for us to build the project due to, um, you know, restrictions on how many people we could have on site. Uh, you know, there was a few mistakes along the way. But, um, yeah, essentially it's a, a three-story building that's 87 square meters on the ground uh, anchored down with 30 tons of soil. So it's a, um, you know, it's a productive, living, living breathing building. Wow. What, what, what was it like trying to pull that together, that sort of living, breathing building? And, and, and what sort of footprint is it making? Well, so over, over 87 square meters, which is a really tiny sort of footprint. Um, so, you know, going vertically sort of makes sense. So this idea could be adapted in any, you know, any country in the world. Um, it'd actually be really interesting to see the building's productivity in, you know, say, Southeast Asia and then, you know, somewhere like Scandinavia, just to see the difference with climate and how that would affect things um, would be pretty cool. But, yeah, it's a, um, 
it's a, it's a pretty wild building and it's aesthetically really quite beautiful and I think um, some of the feedback that we get that it's, it's all a little bit overwhelming. Um, there's so many elements here, like, you know, every single piece of timber in this building we fell and, um, you know, uh, two macrocarpa trees, which is a cypress and a sugar gum, you know, really productive trees that farmers could be, you know, generating other incomes from, you know, if they're having a bad year with wheat or a bad year with livestock. So, yeah, everything was um, milled ourselves and all cured in a solar kiln by uh, Aramore Furniture in Ballarat. So, you know, every single piece of this building has traceability. There's no FSC timber, there's no PVC glues or pipes, there's no glues. It's all, it's all, it's a natural building. And it was actually really quite phenomenal during the building process because it never felt like a building site. It was always, it always smelt natural and it always felt natural. Um, and that was, you know, a lot of comments we got back when we were showing people through the build that it didn't feel like a building site because there's nothing toxic here. It's all natural. Wow. Well, it's getting cold at the moment. How does the building operate in regards to insulation and, and keeping warmth? Well, we're, all of the building is insulated with a uh, Jura panel. So it's um, basically wooden, uh, sorry, cladding that's made with straw. Um, a byproduct from you know straw you could argue it could be churned back into the ground uh but if you compare it to you know chipboard or um you know regular building cladding uh most of it comes from china uh, it's imported it's full of toxic bits and pieces so it's a really natural um sort of insulation and it breathes with the building so we've embedded biochar so basically um charred olive pips into the walls to take out carbon monoxide um, and it kind of holds heat, it keeps things cool. So it's really, um, you know, it's a really interesting material. It's mostly used in uh, studios for sound, um, you know, for when people are recording music. But, you know, applying it in, into a house is a really nice thing to do. And then we have an amazing, uh, all of the glass is made in the Dandenong Ranges, so local as well, uh, and it's thermally broken. So basically it's two sheets of glass with about 30 mil uh, gap in between so you know once you seal up the building it's it, it'll stay as warm as you want it to be or it can stay as cool as you want it to be but it's also really silent which is um quite important when you're in the middle of the city you mentioned about the productivity of the building can you can you tell us what you mean by that well it's um i mean it's it's a really the amount of food we started documenting everything we we're picking and then we just got too busy and kind of lost track of it but you know like it's it's really insane. Like I picked about three kilos of tomatoes yesterday, and we're nearly in winter. Like it's it's really phenomenal. Like I'm looking at three cabbages right now, and you know, like you look at a cabbage, and these bloody little cabbages have been were one of the first things planted in November last year, and they're only just nearly ready. And then you kind of think about that, and you buy a cabbage in the supermarket, and it's like two or three bucks. Um, and also in the beds that the cabbages are in, nothing else has really thrived around it because they take so much nutrients from the soil. Um, and then we kind of value that as a really cheap product for some reason. So kind of when you watch how things grow and how productive they are, you kind of understand how broken our food system is. You know, like how can, how can this, you know, this little cabbage that I'm looking at now have been growing for, you know, sort of seven, eight months and it's, it's such a cheap product. And then, you know, then I don't know, it's just a really weird one. I think the, the most important way you could live sustainably is, is growing your own food and, you know, for me, I kind of look at it from the other way. It's the most delicious food. And that's why I found myself on this journey is because the most sustainably produced food is always the most delicious food. And as a cook, it's my job to serve delicious food. So why wouldn't I, you know, want to be around these ingredients? It's, it's easy and you know? I can just cut and serve. Like I don't have to do anything. You mentioned the tomatoes and the cabbages, but you also got that wall with the amazing fungus mush and mushrooms. And um, tell us about what you are growing on site, some of the really... Um sort of out there things that you're doing well we have uh we have the mushroom which is a really cool experiment which we've um uh there's up to 24 varieties of mushrooms that are going through that room um, wow uh, two of them are native to australia which um john uh who is an amazing guy he was a marine biologist and got fed up with um basically you know, he kind of said that there's not really any way to fish sustainably anymore. And then there's so much bureaucracy around sustainable fishing. And, you know, that book that's just come out, Toxic, down in Tassie, it kind of sums it all up. And he got fed up with that. So he, um, you know, applied his smarts to mushroom uh, cultivation. And he's, yeah, he's cultivated two native Australian mushrooms that he found in the Dandenong Ranges um, and then a bunch of other varieties as well. So that's a, it's a really productive room. We've had a lot of ups and downs with it, um, balancing it and keeping it sort of in the right environment but it's um you know we're churning out a huge amount of food from it so it captures captures the steam from the shower which pumps into it to create
create the humidity and then the overflow uh, from the hot water system goes in to make more humidity and then uh, fresh air as well. So it's a, a, yeah, it's been a really big experiment, but it's, um, it's super cool and it's right in the entrance of, of, of the building when you walk in. So, you know, it's one of the first things that you see and it's, um, you know, for, for aesthetics, it's beautiful, but then it's also a really productive thing. And all of the mushrooms are grown on a mixture of coffee and sawdust from the building, uh, from all of the milling of the timber, coffee that Yost has gathered from cafes around Melbourne. Uh, they get inoculated with the different mycelium, and then um, and they're all in old feta buckets. So Yosti, um doing his flower runs and stuff through the years, just noticed that the back of my, a lot of cafes was full of these white plastic buckets that, you know, that every restaurant has them. You know, salt comes in them, feta comes in them, and they were never really used for much. So, you know, Yosti, being the creative genius that he is, has made something really beautiful from a bunch of crappy white buckets. Well, most of us know about eight varieties of mushrooms that you see in, in supermarkets or fruit and veg shops. Well, how different are the varieties that you have and, and what's it been like cooking them? It's super cool. Our um, One of the biggest issues we face is not having too many mushrooms in the menu just because we have so many varieties. <laughs> and, you know, from uh, like, for example, a like the oyster mushrooms, like gold ones, uh, pink ones, blue ones, you know, we developed a really cool method of just absolutely caning them in um, cast iron pans uh, between two and like compressing them as they cook and they kind of turn into a mushroom steak which uh, which is super cool and then we glaze that with a mushroom garum so it's kind of like a, a soy sauce that we've made from mushroom trimmings koji and salt so that was kind of one application but the, actually the only dish we've had on the menu the whole time is a um, is a mushroom skewer which kind of changes as to what we have but it's a um, it's a really simple one I think last night we had lion's mane king oyster and shiitakes that we um, put on a bay leaf skewer glaze it with a mixture of uh, some split pea miso and uh, mushroom garum and just barbecue it serve it straight off the barbie and it's just a really yummy little snack um, it, vegetables aren't the only thing that you're growing on the premises. You've got um, insects and, and fish and all sorts of things. Tell us about um, the challenges in, in that sort of thing. Well, yeah, so we've got uh, what Yost calls the MCG, which is the Melbourne Cricket Ground. So we grow crickets, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're, they're super productive. They sort of in about 30 to 40 days can almost double in, in the volume. Um so they – and they ate all of the veggie trimmings. Like I just fed them some offcuts, you know, outer leaves of some broccolis that I just picked and they sort of take all of the – you know, it's things we could be using for sure. But, um, you know, if it's food for another another food source, that's kind of cool. So, yeah, the crickets are great. We, we make a cricket ball, uh, which is kind of like a falafel <laughs> with, um, with wow. some crowded chickpeas that we grew on the roof um, and just classic kind of flavouring, some herbs, veggies and spices. Um but with, with the crickets, we don't want to serve them for shock value. We want to serve them for, for the right reason. So instead of just serving fried crickets, which we, we do a few little fried ones as well, but you know, incorporating it into a food um, with meaning rather than just to be, you know, get an Instagram photo, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and then we have uh, we have barramundi growing downstairs, and you know balancing the aquaponics system was a really big one. It's a really hard thing, and I, I mean Joe sums it up really well. You can kind of smell and feel if everything's working because if any of the systems are out of balance you kind of you're so in tune with it that you notice so you know it's been really interesting um your other senses other than just tasting and looking at things have really become in tune with the house um which is yeah we had a lot of issues getting the aquaponics right at the start we had a lot of um unfortunately fatalities along the way but it's um i think it's important to talk about that stuff because it's all a learning process it's all a journey what have been some of the challenges on the way? You, you mentioned that it's really about problem solving and finding out and finding solutions on the way, and that's part of the journey that you're going on. What's been some of those that you can tell us about? Uh, well, definitely the aquaponics at the start was a huge, a huge challenge. Uh, we put the barramundi in our top system, and we just couldn't keep the water warm enough. Uh, they need to be around 29 degrees to be happy. And we're sort of at our power limit um, with the solar that we've been collecting, so we couldn't really bring in any heat pumps and that's kind of counterintuitive to the whole idea of of what we're trying to do here so yeah it was it was a pretty sad day when we came in and um it was before we'd actually moved into the building um i think i went out for lunch and i came just by the house just to check on things and yeah the fish weren't doing well and it was a pretty pretty sad night to be honest we we lost um a lot of fish yeah it was yeah they ended up back in the gardens and we planted trees above them so they're not gone completely to waste but just watching it and feeling a little bit powerless as to what you can do because we just didn't have the answers um 
So, yeah, we've rectified that by building a second aquaponic system downstairs that is warmed by the excess heat coming off the water heater. And then we've put uh, rainbow trout out the top, which are completely fine in cooler sort of environments. And they came in as fingerling, so, you know, the size of your pinky. And now they're about the size, they're about probably 15 centimetres in, in length. Which, wow. Which is super cool to see. And, and we've also got yabbies up in the top aquaponics as well. Uh, as you mentioned at the top of the show, you've um, this has been some part of your life for a lot of your career. Um, but has this experience changed your perceptions or have you learnt new things in regards to sustainability on this journey? Um, I guess it's just really reassured um, what we've sort of started on and, and what is the future. You know, there's a lot of... There's a lot of talk about sustainability amongst chefs and restaurants, which is amazing, uh, and no waste. But I think um, unless you do it, things won't change. You know, like when we opened Silo, uh, what was that, maybe six? No, eight years ago. Um, everyone told us it was impossible. You can't open a zero-waste restaurant. And now, globally, it's one of the most talked about things in restaurants is going to a zero-waste system. So, you know, I think the biggest effects of this building and this project will be seen in, in years to come. But I think now it'll be a lot faster because people are really into it and care about it. And, yeah, I don't know. I think it's something that um, it's going to have a it's going to have a big impact for sure. Well, as you mentioned, change is the hardest thing for most people to um adapt to and to implement, um, particularly when they're trying to run a business and remain viable. But what's some of the things that uh, you've been learning on the go with future food systems that could be easily implemented into restaurants? Well, I mean, the biggest way to eliminate waste is don't let waste in. So, you know, refusing to take, um, you know, waxed boxes, uh, just kind of looking at what is coming in is, is a really big start. Uh, I think eating seasonally is a huge one because, you know, if you're, Eating, like, how many cafes have avocados on all year that have been trucked around all over the place, in and out of cold store? Like, it's a much bigger effect than just, you know, the skin and seed that are left over of these things. You've got to look at it from a bigger point of view. And I think nothing's too small. Even if you start by growing a pot of parsley, you know, in on a, on a balcony somewhere, and then you start to use that pot of parsley and you pick it and you eat it, and it's delicious. It's never going to taste any better than when you pick and eat. And, you know, you look at animals in the wild, they're not eating dead shit off the floor they're eating stuff that's live from from a plant so you know what would if you can't mimic nature in a lot of ways you can actually live a lot more sustainably but most importantly it's more delicious so you know grow a pot of parsley and then in summer you might grow a pot of basil and then you might put a tomato plant in and it, it's kind of yeah nothing is too small and once you start doing this it kind of naturally just progresses and, and builds on it so i think yeah just the smallest changes even if it's as big as um i mean this isn't anything new but you never joe and i have a, a thing that we'll never if we can't sit down and have a coffee in a coffee shop or if we don't have a cup with us you just don't have a coffee you know like and that's a huge thing to just eliminate waste and just say no and stick to those sort of values and go well if i can't make 10 minutes to sit down and have a coffee uh, if i'm that much of a rush and i don't have a cup with me too bad you're not having a coffee so just kind of sacrificing a, a few things along the way but it actually has a big impact uh, you just mentioned Joe Barrett, who is your partner in business and in in life. What's what's it been like um, working together and and experiencing uh, this this whole new uh, future food systems uh, and living there as well? Yeah, I mean, look, it's um, there's no denying it's challenging, right? When you spend all of your time um, both personally and professionally together, uh, but you know, Joe has this amazing calmness about her. She kind of she's she's a deep thinker and she looks at situations and and you know she's definitely made me a better person and a better cook just with her sort of calmness um but also drive and ambition to be the best and she she really is i think you know in in so many elements of what she does she is an amazing person an amazing human but also a phenomenal cook um and yeah she going across you know from pastry to savory like she there's not much that she can't do and she's um she's very humble about it but yeah, I think she's a very a very special person and a really sort of great person in my life because, I don't know, sometimes you just need to be brought down a peg or two and put back to reality. And, yeah, I think Joe has this great ability to very calmly tell me to pull my head in, head in um, at times in, in a really nice way. And yeah, it's, um, it's pretty special what we have. You uh, originally didn't plan to have a restaurant in the, in the site, um, but, th- you know, COVID wasn't a plan either. Um, you're both working at Oak Ridge and, and that 
time ended. Tell us about that period of time and sort of the impact it, it had on you and um, and your role in hospitality. Yeah, I mean, Oak Ridge was a, um, it ended up being five years we were there, which kind of flew by, but it was a sort of weird one. I kind of got questioned by a lot of colleagues as to how it would fit. You know, it was quite a commercial, very high, very architecturally designed sort of, you know, it's a very great winery, but it's not really pushing the boundaries in terms of sustainability. It definitely changed a lot in our time there. We started, you know, started cover cropping and doing other bits and pieces. But I think what happened at Oak Ridge is we we're giving a, we we're given a platform to, to do what we wanted to do. And, you know, the faith and backing of Tony and Alana, the owners, um, to invest in us to grow a garden and to have, you know, uh, a greenhouse and to be able to just sort of make up our own sort of journey there, which was um, an amazing opportunity. And it really, you know, I, I have so much love and respect for, for them for giving us that chance. And it gave us the chance to, um, you know, show you can make a localised cuisine really desirable. You know, we only cook things from the Yarra Valley. We, we called it Yarra Valley Cuisine. Uh, and I don't think anyone had ever really done that. People talked about cooking locally, but then they'd still serve some snapper from Queensland. You know, it just didn't make sense to me to, to do that. So it was, um, it was a really, it was an amazing time. And by the end, you know, our team was so strong and so tight. Um, you know, we didn't have no, very few chefs left once they were in with us. And yeah, it's just, um, I wish we had more space to have more of the team here with us now, but uh, we still have... Louise Daly, who um, she worked by my side for, for around four years at Oak Ridge. And, you know, she's now sort of our head chef here at the house. And, you know, she she's an amazing cook. She has an amazing palate. Um, we call her the Time Lord because she is constantly, you know, even when I come to take this call, she's like, how long are you going to be? Um, and I told her half an hour, but it's going to be an hour. But that's cool. Because <laughs> I saw the look in her eye. But, um, you know, she just manages us really well. And she's an amazing colleague to have. Well, let's let's look at what you're doing there. Um, what, what's it been like uh, creating a restaurant experience in in the house and and creating that menu? Tell us a bit about that. Well, we kind of we wanted to make a cuisine out of this house that was we were, we want to call it the most exciting food in the world. And if you look on our Instagram, you know we don't really talk about it's only food. You know, there's there's so many other elements to this which we kind of put in the story highlights, but. It's all about the food because if we're not making exciting, amazing, delicious food, this whole concept doesn't have any weight. So it's um, it's interesting. And from the first menu that we sort of proposed uh, to what we're doing now is very different. You know, we're kind of working off one induction stove, two domestic ovens and a barbecue. Um, and we're only feeding 14 guests a night, but it's about sort of 10, eight to 10 courses depending on the day. But there's literally three or four of us doing the whole thing. So we... We're cooking, we're cleaning, we're doing the laundry, we're folding the napkins, we are doing the harvesting and the gardening, we're planting. I've got two chooks that make a fucking mess every day. But they're really <laughs> cute, so so it's, it's, you know, we end up spending about half an hour a day cleaning up after them. But, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way because they've become part of the family. So it's a, um, it's a really unique experience and it's not really like a restaurant and it's, it's more of a dinner party at home. Um, in an orchestrated sort of way. So it's um, it's really fun and, you know, a lot of days we're just, you know, in the weeds as, as the podcast uh, says and we, you know, we have to push and rush but then when guests come in and they have a nice time and we, you know, share some drinks and cook them some food and you go, well, you know, this is really worth it. What's some of the dishes that you can tell us about that you, um, you know, that you, you really love at the moment that you're cooking? Uh, so the cricket balls, which I mentioned, are pretty fun. That's a nice little snack. Uh, what else? The We do uh, the sort of main course. Uh, we call it dinner at Yo's house because uh, Yo's he always will make us this fermented uh, rice risotto. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's absolutely terrible. Um, he's sort of a bit all over it, all over the place with his cooking abilities. Um, so we've done a sort of refined version of that with a bunch of different sprouted grains. Um, we harvested a heap of corn last week, so we kind of enriched it with a corn puree. Uh, and because like, we don't have any fat as such, we don't have butter, cream, mascarpone. So to make a risotto-style dish and make it unctuous and yummy um, was quite, a, quite an achievement, I think. And so we use a puree of cashew nuts, a puree of leek, and a puree of sweet corn to give that sort of luscious texture. And it's, um, it's all vegan, uh, and, but it's just really delicious. So that's kind of sort of the mainish course, which is great. Uh, what else? At the moment, we picked a bunch of parsnips. So we're doing a, a little um, sort of semi-burnt glazed parsnip, honey, and walnut miso sort of side dish tonight, which will be pretty pretty cool. Um, we've got the chook, so we, we get a few eggs a day. So we're doing a, um, 
a chow and mushy, uh, sort of steamed egg savory custard that goes with the mushroom skewer. Uh, but we're flavoring that with a broth made of all of the offcuts and trimmings of the house, so yabby shells, the barramundi bones, uh, but really pumping it up with a heap of white pepper. So you get this lovely warming sort of little cuddle on the inside. That's an, uh, another one. And we actually grate um, wild mushrooms and some of the mushrooms from the mushroom on top of that, but we dry them by the sun. Um, so, you know, in Scandinavia, historically, they would forage wild mushrooms and dry them uh, gill side up in the sun because it retains vitamin D. So you have this sort of vitamin D source that's delicious and nutritious in the middle of winter when, when you couldn't normally find it. So, you know, we're implementing a lot of sort of proven primitive techniques into a new cuisine in a lot of ways. Well, uh, you're in Federation Square. What, what's the longevity of, of this project and what, what are the plans moving forward? Uh, I mean, it's a million dollar question. We, we, we might stay longer. Currently, we're here till June. Um, but it's a really hard one because, uh, honestly, it's, it's really hard to make it stack up financially for us at the moment. It's, um, it's a crazy experiment. It's a passion project. But, you know, it's not really that sustainable in terms of finances to keep going the way we are. So, yeah, we're kind of looking at a few, a few ways around that. We'd love to be creating more content and sharing more of what we're doing rather than you know, being stuck to the stove all day and, and tidying up and looking after everyone. So we're just kind of assessing how that looks and what is possible. It's, um, yeah, to be honest, I thought we might have had a bit more of, um, you know, financial support from either tourism or, or the city of Melbourne, which uh, we're working on. So, yeah, it's kind of dependent on, on what sort of a situation we can come to with everyone. But uh, we'd love to stay for, for another full year just to do a full season of cycle and, you know, when we talk about the nutrient density of everything at the moment, I mean, we can get it all measured and stuff, but all of the soil has come from somewhere else. So if we had a full year, we could actually break down the compost here with new compost that we've generated from the building. So that would be the true representation of, of the possibilities. Uh, what do you hope uh, emerges from this experiment that you're currently doing? Uh, it's, I just want people to take away one or two things and implement them into their you know day-to-day -day life and you know, I think our ability to, to share that is through food and by cooking delicious things. So, you know, if people want to cook the way we do, you kind of have to start to live the way we're living. Um, so, yeah, even like I referenced earlier, just even if people come here, I'd love it and start to grow a pot of parsley on their balcony. That's the first step. So I think it's, um, yeah, just people take away little bits and pieces and implement them into their current lives. And by no means do we think you should go and knock your house down and build a house like this. It's more about, the idea and you can retrofit current buildings to, to be sustainable and to be, you know, a zero waste food system. Well, uh, Matt, hats off to what you, Yost and, and Joe are doing. It's um, incredibly inspiring and very, very important. I would have loved having you on Deep in the Weeds um, and love catching up with you as always. Mate, um, please keep in touch and, uh, and we'll definitely catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks, mate. And thanks. So I've been uh, listening to a lot of your podcasts and it's been a really... Um, a really special thing through a really weird time and I think you've given a platform for people to you know share their feelings and share what they're going through so thank you mate thanks Matt um, catch up soon this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.